Today, Rishi Sunak then uh, says he will warn Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu later to show restraint in his first direct call since those attacks launched by Iran at the weekend. Here's what he told MPs as they returned from a recess yesterday. We are working urgently with our allies to de-escalate the situation and prevent further bloodshed. We want to see calmer heads prevail. And we are directing all our diplomatic efforts to that end. I will also shortly be speaking to Prime Minister Netanyahu to express our solidarity with Israel in the face of this attack and to discuss how we can prevent further escalation. All sides must show restraint. Well, our political correspondent, Alicia Fitzgerald, is back in the studio alongside Conservative commentator Benedict Spence. Good morning, both. Morning. Alicia, how do you think that conversation is going to go down between Sunak and Netanyahu? Well, it's going to be a very difficult conversation, that's for sure. But, I mean, Rishi Sunak and Benjamin Netanyahu have a pretty good relationship and it's definitely improved um, during this conflict. Mm. And I think what Rishi Sunak said in his statement yesterday is that whilst he very much supports Israel and um, condemns what happened with Iran over the weekend, he will urge Netanyahu to show all restraint possible to stop the conflict from escalating any further than it already has. Uh, Benjamin, you wouldn't, um, Benedict, you, <laughs> you wouldn't... Um, you have wouldn't, a direct line to Mr Netanyahu, would you? No. Well, happened. I was trying to do what you did the other day <laughs> at another station, but I thought I'd avoid that. <laughs> Listen, um, my point is this, my friend, I, I, and I'm, I'm really pro this country. Everybody knows that, right? I just don't think that we are as important on the world stage no. as we like to think we are. Mm. Benjamin Netanyahu isn't even listening to America. We yep. have flip-flopped in the last two weeks from Lord David Cameron saying, I don't think either I'm going to tell Israel and I'm going to go to America and I'm going to say... I mean, really? The fact of the matter is, he gets snubbed by everybody in America. Netanyahu will do what Netanyahu wants to do. And I think mm. that's really important, don't you? It is. I mean, that's the idea of sovereignty. That's the idea of a sovereign state. It's the idea of Israel, is that uh, Jewish people who choose to live there don't actually have to live at the whim of other governments and other peoples, because history has shown that doesn't tend to work out particularly well. I mean, you're right, actually. Netanyahu hasn't even listened to the President of the United no. States, who's sort of uh, gone far beyond any uh, president in history in calling for, you know, a de-escalation and a ceasefire and more aid going into Gaza. Netanyahu hasn't listened. It's also not in his interests to do so. The Israeli public is not exactly keen for there to be a de-escalation in Gaza. They want their enemies to be um, uh, nullified. But there have been like... doubts in the last couple of weeks. We were talking about this. I think, <laughs> I think that the Israeli people, from what I've seen, a few protests about this man, what yeah. happened at the weekend plays absolutely into his hands, doesn't yeah. it? And well... solidifies that, that support that might have started to question what they're doing in Gaza. Now, mm. you've been attacked by the by the Iranians. Well, exactly. Bingo. He's not been particularly popular. He wasn't p popular before this war no. started, it must be said. There's been a lot of... You know, the priority for, the, uh, for a lot of people in Israel is the return of the hostages. Uh, after pressure was applied on the Egyptians and the Qataris to say to Hamas, look, can you actually try to get them to come to the table and get some of these hostages out? The Israelis said, look, we'll pull troops out of Gaza if you're prepared to get the hostages out. They did that. Then Hamas came out and said we might not have these people. In fact, most of them may be dead. And the Israelis sort of turned around to the rest of the world and said, well, we did tell you that this would be likely. The strike on the, uh, the consular annex in Damascus was very much a, a tactic to draw Iran into this situation, to get Thank it off you. the fence. Yeah. Because for a very long time, Thank it has you. been playing a very good strategy of getting other people to do its dirty work. Iran had to retaliate, at which point the United States... Had to States, retaliate for its yeah. own people and also to show all the, all the mad people, mm. Hamas and the Houthi rebels and also Hezbollah, that mm. we are with you. So it was a tactic. Which it is was, what absolutely. I've been trying to say yeah. It was a smart with... tactic as well, because, as I say, it necessarily drew the United States. And the United States could not stand there no. and look at its allies being attacked and not reciprocate. Same with the UK, but also the same with Jordan and Saudi Arabia. It was a sign that actually a lot of the Muslim world is not going to stand by. And yeah, for all they talk about, oh, there has to be a ceasefire in Gaza, there has to be a two-state solution, what this proved was actually there is there are new fault lines that have been drawn. And throughout this war, lots of people have been saying the international community is going to put pressure on Israel. We are in a stage now where no Arab country, realistically, beyond Lebanon, which doesn't ultimately matter very much, is prepared to go to war or risk its peace agreements with Israel or the United States over this. That is That's a massive really geopolitical change. what I've been trying change. to say for two days. I wish mm. I'd you yesterday. That's the point I've been trying to make. It's interesting, and we had Jim Townsend on the show earlier, I think it was Jim, who was saying, well, you know, if the US's consulate has, had been hit, which has happened in the past, they mm. would... Um, do a proportionate response and try and specifically target uh, the enemy. But I suppose in this war, as we've seen for the past six months, proportion doesn't really necessarily 
come into it, does it? It must have been terrifying for Israelis uh, to see those rockets coming over. Mm. But what potentially could have happened to them is the reality for what's going on in Gaza. Tens of thousands uh, of innocent people being killed. It feels like the rules of war, if that is even, you know... <laughs> I keep saying it, it's a war. It seems yeah. like it's gone out the window. I don't even understand when they say we're going to send this, we're going to do this, and the war's war, isn't it? But mm. humanitarian law seems to have been thrown out the window on so many occasions. International human rights law, it feels like anything could happen, and that's the kind of tinderbox feeling mm. at the moment, isn't it? Definitely, but I think that's why it's such a difficult one to navigate politically, because yeah. we keep hearing our leaders say, you know, a proportionate response, or, you know, it needs to stay within to humanitarian law. I mean, as you're saying a war is a war there's going mm. to be loss mass casualties there's going to be huge loss of life and there's going to be huge huge terrible consequences that last for years, and years I, i'm going to say something that will probably go down like a lead balloon war you are absolutely right war is war when we were fighting back against the nazis in 1945 we didn't stop and go oh my god there are casualties it's terrible and awful and the humanitarian situation yes, we, but i think the most important we didn't thing target no, no, but I think yes, the most... Yes, we did. No. <laughs> yeah, I, yes, we did. I know, but we... Two, I think the most two million German civilians were killed yeah. in the bombing yeah. alone. I'm and not condoning anything. Be, what I'm saying is I know. think the most interesting thing that we should get across mm. today is what Benedict just said, which is many of the Arab countries, Iran had to be sucked in, it had to show support that has solidified that the world mm. against and behind Israel, <clears throat> a lot of the Arab countries are not prepared to stand up and support what Iran's doing. That's Let me just finish important. that sentence from earlier. Yeah. I understand what happened in the Second World War. However, since then, what we've learnt from mm. the mistakes that happened back then, we should surely now be listening to those lessons. And, and, and I understand that people say, oh, we're, we're holding Israel to a different, to a higher standard mm. than we ourselves would be held to. Look at the war in Iraq, etc. The, the, you know, the innocent yeah. civilians who were killed there. I understand that. However, what is the point of setting these rules if nobody's sticking to them? Well, there is not very much point, yeah. ultimately. And I think we also need to remember Israel is not really a Western country in the no. way that we would think it is a Middle Eastern country. That yeah. explains a lot of its attitudes. And when you exist in that kind of neighbourhood where you have Iran, which is diametrically opposed to your existence, how else are you actually going to respond to these organisations yeah. that are, again, funded by this group, that mm -hmm. are diametrically opposed, and talk actively I about think... genocide? It's a different environment. And it's, I would say... We, in the West, are actually in a very privileged position to be able to sit here and say, well, we have this technology and we have these assets and we have this history, which means that we can set up these laws, and if you don't like it, well, you might end up going to the International Criminal Court. The number of people who don't end up getting taken to the International Criminal Court because we don't care, in Africa, in the Middle East, wherever it is, yeah. is huge, actually. It's only when we get involved on one side that the other side suffers because it is a tool that is used by Western nations to punish those that transgress against the sides we pick. I'm going to avoid Rwanda. Hurrah! Very quickly, the smoking <laughs> ban. You tell us what's happening, you give us your opinion. Today, uh, Rishi Sunak's, you know, nanny state, you can't smoke anymore. I'm on my own in this. Well, I I don't, think you, I don't think you should tell people they can't smoke. Sorry, not changing okay, well, I'll just explain. So this is um, a bill that the government put forward to try and basically phase out um, smoking, uh, so just gradually. And it's obviously facing some opposition. It's a free vote that's in Parliament. So that means that if you are a Conservative Party member and you vote against it, you're not going to come under any kind of scrutiny. You're not going to lose your position. Um, so people are allowed to vote as they wish. We're hearing today that Kemi Badenoch will probably be fronting those voting against it because she, she thinks will. that yeah. this is a bit of a nanny state policy and mm -hmm. that it's the government telling people how to live and what they can and can't do. So I don't think we'll see a smoking ban any time soon, if at all. Benjamin? Do you know what? I actually think that even if this doesn't pass, I think the Labour Party might try to resuscitate it at some point. I simply mm -hmm. think that there is a real drive from amongst a lot of politicians across the world, it's not just a UK thing, uh, to, to eradicate this. I just don't think long-term it's sustainable. We've already seen in New Zealand that they brought in a similar ban and then they rode back on it because actually it was very unpopular. And I think it's a similar thing to prohibition with alcohol. Actually, if you ban it, lots of people might not bother, but lots of people will actually choose to I never thought it. I'd say this because I am a little bit right of centre. Sure. We're going to sit and we're going to have a debate about eradicating smoking and we look at what's going on in the world. Why don't we eradicate the things that really are screwing our lives up? Seriously, that's what I mean. Hand on heart. Smoking a is big... screwing up a lot of people's lives. Oh, what's lives? happening in the Middle East? Would it not be better if we eradicated that? But I mean, you know what's serious? But you know what's particularly sort of ironic? And I'm not, I don't smoke. Listen, sure. I just think that, that, that you get 
to a dangerous... I get all that. Listen, mm. I'm that old. We used to smoke on planes. I've said that. That's abhorrent now. Restaurants, you're absolutely mm. right. I just think you'll get to a point where you go, you can't do this. Whatever it is, alcohol, I think it's dangerous. Have a cigarette right now, then. I think that this is interesting that it's you. coming at the exact same point that there's a mass movement to legalise marijuana. How can you have those two things the, at I'm the totally same time? I'm with you, Benedict. We, we say... Benjamin. <laughs> you keep saying nanny state, nanny state. Yeah. Okay, well then legalise everything. Legalise everything. Let people do whatever they want. I understand you're saying, you know, this is for your own good. Yeah. However, why are children smoking? Why are adults smoking? It's because probably your parents' generation mm. did it because they thought, heaven forbid, we can't even, I can't even imagine this, but they thought it was actually good for them. Because it was advertised as a, as a health product at one point, tobacco was. Well, that so I, just, I was we saying yesterday, I was paid that. by the government three, th seven years ago to front a campaign about vaping, which yeah. was the way to give up smoking. And we both did that, right? So we didn't know each other at that point. We both did vaping. Now they're I saying vaping. Sorry? I wasn't paid, though. I was. Anyway. Uh, it's not about <laughs> the money, though. It's about people. It is. No, it's not about the That's money. That's why I'm here. You're joking. <laughs> I do this because I care. <laughs>